We thank you, love you, and praise you. We ask, Lord, that you would speak loudly to our hearts, Father, that you would show us the difference between a story and a testimony. Father, as we look at John 4, Father, and we look at that woman, that woman who just was blown away. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would allow us to live in her example. Father, we thank you, Lord. We love you and we praise you, Father. And Lord, we know today you want to speak to each one of us individually as you did to that woman. So, Father, prepare our hearts to receive, Lord Jesus, the words that you have for us. We thank you, Father. We love you and praise you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So 4.1 says, The picture was becoming clear as the Pharisees that Jesus had gained a following much larger than that, than that of John the Baptist. The wandering prophet. Now he could see that the Pharisees were beginning to plot against him. This was because his disciples were busy ritually cleansing many new disciples through baptism. He chose to leave Judea where most Pharisees lived and returned to a safer location in Galilee. This was a trip that would take them through Samaria. Now, the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along well at all. No, not at all. They didn't like each other. All right, so, you know, for, for Jesus to say, oh, wow, it's up there. For Jesus to say this is what was going to go on, he, he was going to take off and go through this. Now, if we keep reading in verse 5, Nope, guess not. Okay, verse 5. I'm, I'll read it. Don't worry about it, Barbara. In a small Samaritan town known as Sychar, and remember I said Sychar in the Greek means drunkenness and all these other things. It's a bad place. It's where people do not live according to the things that they are supposed to live through or live in. And so this was a town of, you know, a lot of weird sexual stuff going on, a lot of drunkenness, a lot of this, a lot of that, a lot of sin, a lot of sin. And so here, here Jesus comes, all right, and he's coming through the center of this town, a Samaritan town, but a town full of sin and a town full of not living right. And so Jesus and his entourage stopped to rest at the historic well that Jacob gave his son Joseph. It was about noon when Jesus found a spot to sit close to the well while the disciples ventured off to find provisions from his, from his vantage. He watched as a Samaritan woman approached to draw some water. Unexpectedly, he spoke to her. Now, remember, there is a wicked hatred between these two crowds of people. Now, it is uncommon to speak to a Samaritan woman if you're a Jew. It just doesn't happen. And so she's sitting there getting water, and Jesus is just, excuse me, observing. And, and all of a sudden, he says something to her. He says, would you draw water and give me a drink? And the woman looked at him and said, I cannot believe that you, a Jew, would associate with me as Samaritan women, much less ask me to give you a drink. Jews, you see, have no dealings with Samaritans. And also, a man never approaches a woman like this in public. So Jesus is breaking accepted social barriers with this confrontation. And Jesus said to her, he said, you don't know the gift of God or who is asking you for, for a drink of this water from Jacob's well. Because if you did, you would have asked him for something greater, and he would have given you the living water. So she said, sir, you sit by the deep well, you sit by this deep well, a thirsty man without a bucket, without a bucket in sight. Where does this living water come from? Ah. Where does this living water come from? Are you claiming superiority to our father Jacob, who labored long and hard to dig and maintain this well so that he could share clean water with his son's grandchildren and cattle? 
And Jesus said this, drink this water and your thirst is quenched only for a moment. Drink this water and your thirst is only quenched for a moment. You must return to this well again and again. I offer water that will become a wellspring within you that gives life throughout eternity. You will never be thirsty again. And the woman said, please, sir, give me some of this water so I'll never be thirsty and never again have to make this trip to the well. And then here's where Jesus, see, this is, this is the point. We think we can hide things from God. We do. Well, if I do it in this room with the light off, God will never know what I'm doing. Well, if I do this over here in the shadows, God will never know what I'm doing. Do you understand this? He created you. He knows every bit of your molecular structure. He knows every single thing you think before you've thought it. He knows everything you're going to do before you do it. Some of you are probably going, why doesn't he stop me from being stupid? Because he's a gentleman. He's a gentleman. He doesn't interfere with your decisions. So Jesus says, remember, knowing the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, the three into one, knowing he asks the woman, go get your husband and bring him here. Because see, this is, this is where the test comes from. You know, go get your husband and bring him here. I, I love this. She says, I do not have a husband. And then Jesus looks at her and says, well, technically you're telling the truth. But you have had five husbands and are currently living with a man you are not married to. At this point in time, she's floored. Because he's just told her exactly what she's been doing most of her life. Now, I've said this before. And people, people that come in here and sit down and expect to get the watered-down, ridiculous, stupid message that they get probably in 90% of the churches across the world now. They come in here, and I've always said this. The Lord has a personal message for you in the situations and circumstances that you're in today. And everybody hears a different message in this church. Because God wants to speak to you individually. Individually, if you were here Wednesday night, if you watched Wednesday night, we spoke about that a little bit. He wants to speak to you individually about circumstances and situations in your life. It's kind of interesting because, again, Saturday mornings we do the Soul Series. And it's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm up here just relaying what God had given me on, on soul trauma. And everybody's being affected in some other situation and way because they're hearing something that affects them in their life because, again, God knows everything. He knows everything. And in everything, he wants to personally speak to you. And there's a reason. We'll get to that in a minute. So all of a sudden, the woman says, Sir, it is obvious to me that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped here on this mountain, but your people say that Jerusalem is the only place for all to worship. Which is it? And Jesus says, woman, I tell you that neither is as so. <coughs> Believe this, a new day is coming. In fact, it's already here. When the importance will not be placed on the time and the place of worship, but on the truthful hearts of worshipers. It's not about worshiping. It's about the truthful heart of worship. You worship what you don't know, while we worship what we do know. For God's salvation is coming through the Jews. The Father is spirit, and he is seeking followers whose worship is sourced in truth and deeply spiritual as well. Regardless of whether you are in Jerusalem or on this mountain, if you do not seek the Father, then you do not worship. Then you do not worship. And the woman said, these mysteries will be made clear by he who is promised 
the anointed one. And Jesus said, the anointed is speaking to you. I am the one you have been looking for. So again, the disciples returned to him and gathered around him in amazement that he would openly break their customs by speaking to this woman, but none of them would ask him what he was looking for or why he was speaking with her. Now the woman went back to town, all right, leaving her water pot behind. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. She stopped men and women on the streets and told them about what happened. I met a stranger who knew everything about me. Come and see for yourself. And then I love this. There's a question. Could it be Jesus? Could it be the Messiah? Could it be the anointed one? Could it be? Could it be? A crowd came out of the city and approached Jesus during all this. The disciples were urging Jesus to eat the food they gathered. Now, again, last week we spoke about the testimony of a person and the results that can come from it. If the testimony is one of repentance and acceptance, which leads to redemption, there is an amazing result that will come. Yesterday we spoke in our soul trauma thing about about B.C. Most of our trauma starts B.C. before Christ. And then there will be trauma that will be brought along AC after Christ. And so if we are equipped to handle the trauma AC and we handle it in a way that glorifies God, then that becomes part of our testimony. Part of our testimony. But if we handle it all wrong, it creates trauma which creates a broken peace, which creates a number of other things. You want to know about that, you be here Saturday morning. Because I'm not going to do the whole thing today. I got another message I need to get across to you. So again, there's an amazing result that will come. I love that when she spoke of what happened, when this woman, this Samaritan woman, spoke of what happened, she brought it out in a question. Too many times we take the King James and we start slapping people in the forehead with it. And that doesn't work. I always used to walk up to a person when I was out in the streets witnessing, and I would say, what's going to happen if you walk off the sidewalk and a bus doesn't stop and flattens you out? Where are you going to go? And it's funny getting some of the answers. And then I'd come back with this. Well, you don't know where you're going. Would you like to know where you can go? See? This woman started in extreme excitement. Extreme excitement. Started to tell people what happened. And in this extreme excitement, she asked a question. Could it be him? Could it be him? When, when, when we're walking in our testimony, we, we, have to, we have to pose this in such a manner that people, first of all, are drawn in by what we're saying. And second of all, you know, wh- one of the best things is, is to end a sentence with a question. Make them answer you. So she said, could this be? Now, you know, in their minds, they're going... Well, maybe it is. We got to go see this guy. We got to go talk to him. Because remember what I said last week, the whole Samaritan town of Sychar was gloriously redeemed because of this one woman's testimony. This one woman's testimony. So let me keep going. So, again, she said, I met a stranger who knew everything about me. Come and see for yourselves. Can he be the anointed one? So here's my question this morning. How absorbed are you in what Christ has done for you? Because remember, this woman left and left her water bowl. See? Why? Because that was the bowl for water that was going to create more thirst. She now had the living water within her. 
and she would thirst no more. So in her excitement of receiving what she just received and the fact that this guy just told her everything about her life, she just, she had to go and shout it from the mountaintop. How excited are you about what God has done for you? Because I'll tell you, a testimony is the most important, important part of being a believer. Let's keep going. So again, let's look at this for a moment. The woman at the well left her water pot. Now some may say, well, she left it for Christ to use. That's, that's, that's a great excuse. She left it for Christ to use. No, she left it because she was so excited at what Jesus had just done for her. He had set her free from the bondage of her past. And she was ecstatic. She was ecstatic. You know, you know why believers aren't ecstatic? Because they don't allow the fullness of God's word to work. They only tell, well, you know... Had this woman said, well, you know, yeah, I was married five times. That's why I'm living with this guy now, because I don't want to make the same mistake. You're still living in sin, sweetheart. That's the way it works. See? But instead, she received the fullness of what God had. And in the fullness was set free. Set free. Now, you know... You guys know how, how I feel about different programs in the world. And, and it's, not, it's not because I've had a bad experience with them. It's because I know other people that have been in bondage to them and are still in bondage to them and will never be set free unless they're set free by he. See? It's, it's not that I ha have a, a, a hatred for programs. I have a very strong dislike for the fact that they take you from one bondage and make you bondage to something else. See, it's kind of funny because I've been judged for my, not so much for my opinion on them, but from the studies and research I have done that I come to my decision with. Plus, from experience. Somebody said, well, the reason you didn't like them is, you know, this and this. And it's like, no, the reason I didn't go forward, because I've shared that I went to the second step, and the Lord said, why are you going there? That's not going to deliver you. That's not going to set you free. Jump into my arms. This is where you find true freedom. This is where you find redemption. This is where you find truth. This woman had been in the program of sin her entire life. And now God came with deliverance. Deliverance. See, that's the difference. You know, I, I love it where it says, free at last, where Martin Luther King said, free at last, free at last. Thank God, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. He knew that the only way to freedom was through God. The only way through freedom to freedom is through repentance, reception, transformation, and you are set free. You're set free. See? Now, I, wa I want to continue on here. Because, again, she was set free. She left her pot. Again, excitement i got to go tell people. But again, how many become so excited that what they have learned, that they run right out and just leave everything in their enthusiasm? Tough question, first thing on a Sunday morning. Because we've been given something that's so amazing. So amazing. And just think about this. If Jesus showed up today and he sat next to you, which he is, by the way, the Holy Spirit is right there today. And the Holy Spirit is relaying God's word to you. 
If you're that ignorant and arrogant not to listen, and instead of living in condemnation, come to the place of conviction, if you're that arrogant and ignorant to not take the words that the Creator who knows you better than you know yourself has something to say to you because He knows that if you listen and it's AC after Christ, you've got the basis and a foundation for a testimony that could literally change lives. Literally. But if you I can't believe the pastor's talking about me. If you're that ignorant and that arrogant, then I'm going to tell you what comes out of your mouth. You ready for this? But how many become so excited about what they learn that they run out of and just leave everything in their enthusiasm? I would almost guarantee that this woman's posture, the posture, and the shine in her eyes gave away her excitement. Well, you got to come to my church. Maybe Jesus will do something for you. Instead of saying, I can't believe what God's spoken to me about. I can't believe the things he brings forward in my life. Wow, I didn't even remember that, and it was brought forward. And as I listened, he led me in the way of redemption. you got to come. God's got a message for you. I'm not saying that because I want to be mean. I'm saying that because, every, like I said before, I used to go to church and the pastor used to look, stare me down and point at me. And I, I used to go, oh, oh. And then I came to the point where all of a sudden I started to listen. And all of a sudden I started to apply the things that the Lord, was revealing to me that I had never revealed to anybody. And in application, my testimony grew. My testimony grew. I don't talk a lot about my testimony. Someday I will. Every now and then a little eeks out. But I've seen God do some amazing things. And that's why I know that there is power in the blood of the sacrificial lamb. Amazing power. And I know that because I've seen this and because I've allowed God to speak to me and show me the things, just like he did that Samaritan woman, you've been doing this. And now you're gonna, how are you going to get out of that? How are you going to escape the bondage of that? Ask for my forgiveness. Ask for my forgiveness. And watch what happens. The important part of this is when we ask, we must receive it. Application of the asking. See? One of the most hurtful things in bringing the saving grace of Jesus alive is despondency. <coughs> and it's despondency on our account of what the Lord has done. We become despondent. We know what it is. We've seen what he's done. We don't get excited. All of a sudden, we're just like, we're despondent. Well, and, and in despondency, you know what happens? We get angry. We get angry. And the easiest one to get angry at is me. Because I'm the one bringing the word that God wants you to hear. But you need to get mad at the Holy Spirit because he's sitting right next to you and he's revealing in your circumstance and situation what God wants you to deal with. I think it was Elton John that said, don't shoot me, I'm just the messenger. He had that in a song. I'm just the messenger. I'm just doing what God wants me to do. Hopefully, it will put a spark in you. So as I, as I, as I want to, I want to expound on this, this word despondency in a minute, but I, w I want to first look at the word everything. 
In the Greek, it's the word pos, and it means all things, nothing hidden. There's nothing hidden in your life from God. It as well means all manner of, always, daily, and everything, which means every day when you wake up, God already knows what you're going to do. And he offers little things in the way to keep you from doing the things that you do. But if you're just barreling through life and not paying attention to God, you're going to get involved in all sorts of crap. Some of that crap can create trauma, especially if you don't handle it right. Some of it won't. Some of it will just keep the blessings that God already has stacked up, ready to go, keep you from it. Well, Pastor Mark, I can't understand why God's not blessing me. You sure you want to know? Sure you want to know? How about this, 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 and this? Well, how do you know? Because God's revealed it. I remember sitting down one day in the library, which was used to be my office, and a couple came in, and I sat down. And before I ever meet with people, I always pray, Lord, you need to give me what I need to bring you into the situation. And so I sat down, and, and you know, I loved it because the wife thought she was perfect. And, and the guy came in, and he says, well, you know, I, I, I've made some mistakes. And I go, here's what you've done. And the Lord's given me this. And she's like going, and she goes, I've done nothing. And I go, wait a minute. This is what, wait, oh, nope. This, 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 and this. Now, she had never told anybody. See? And it was like, oh. Oh. See, the Lord knows you. He knows everything about you. And you know what's funny? Even though he knows you, he wants to redeem you. He wants to redeem you. Because he loves you. Because he loves you. Now, in an, individu in an individual basis, it means he knows absolutely everything about you individually. All of it. Now, it as well means that he knows all, but when allowed, works on each thing in an individual manner. So every single moment there's something, well, maybe you've stacked up the sin in your life like cordwood. And God's going to take each individual stick out of that cord and deal with it. Oh, I'm done. Here comes another one. Here comes another one. Until the cord is gone. Because some of us have stacked it up pretty deep. And then we buried it. And you know what I've noticed about buried things? We have a, somebody buried a boatload of rocks in our yard. As the ground settles, the rocks come to the top. So as we get comfortable, the sin comes to the top. Because the Bible says that, you know, your sin will seek you out. Your sin will seek you out. And so it does. And pretty soon we get to the point where we've forgotten the sin, so we, we stop covering it, and so it becomes exposed. And in exposure, what happens? Well, for me, ex in exposure, what happens is I hit the rock with my lawnmower, and now i got to go buy new blades all the time. It dulls the senses against Christ dulls the senses to God and his word. See? Again, each individual manner. It's a straightforward reckoning. I know for me, every time Jesus brought something to the forefront of my life, A, I began to listen. And B, I began to, tricky word here, respond. Because you know what our natural, our natural Adam nature wants to do? React. React. And in reaction, 
How does that glorify God in our testimony? It doesn't. It doesn't. In reaction, we drive people away. Lunatic. Check that one off. Get away, stay away, never be around, because all you're going to hear is pissing and moaning and complaining. That's it. All the time. But see, in responding to God's word, we respond and we receive and as we receive, we glorify God. We give him the glory for bringing it to our attention and allowing us to deal with it and say, Father, set me free. Again, we get caught up in the reaction of the old man, Adam, condemnation rather than the transformed new name, man of conviction. Now, respondent in the Greek is a thumio. And it means to lose heart and be disheartened. In the flesh, in condemnation, we automatically go, ready for this? This is too hard. I remember for one solid year, God said, I want you to speak in obedience. I go, okay, no problem. I can do that. And so I studied obedience out. And for a solid 12-month period of time, we only spoke on obedience. A solid year. Now, in that solid year, God shook the tree four or five times. I had somebody come up to me and said this. They said, you're only speaking on obedience because you weren't, obedience to, you weren't obedient to God. And I go, you're right, I wasn't. At one time, I was not. I said, but that's not why God is speaking, having me speak on obedience. I said, it's because there are a few of you that don't respond to the obedience of God's word. Four people left. Still kept speaking on obedience. God shook the tree again. Six more people left. When we were done, 12 people had left. But a number of people came because that's what they needed to learn is how to be obedient to God's word. God says obedience is more important than sacrifice. Obedience. To what? I'm holding it up again. Every service I've held this up. The instruction book. Now, I'm watching churches Disobey what God's word says. They're changing it so that they, they're changing it so that it can, they can fit their desires and their needs instead of trusting God to fulfill the things He has ordained. Of course, in Revelations, if you understand, in the very back of the book, it says, Woe to those who change or rewrite the words of this book. So how many of us change the definition of the written and spoken word to fit our agenda? Many, many do. Why? Because it's too hard. I don't think it's too hard, especially where it says these words. Cast your cares on me. <coughs> In other words, let him transform you. <coughs> let him deliver you. Let him heal you. Let him redeem you. And let him lead you. Lead you. How does it go when you start leading your life? Hmm. Does it honor God? Don't tell me you're feeding dinner to people and all the rest of this happy crap because God says it's not about works. 
You can work all you want. Doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Doesn't mean dilly squat. Obedience to the fullness of the word is what matters. Walking absolutely by faith. Faith without, faith without works is dead. And works without faith is dead. So if you're only applying one part of it, eh. oh, but God, I, I ran around serving 350,000 dinners to all these people. But did you believe fully in me? Oh. <laughs> did you live by every written word and every spoken word in my book? We become dismayed if we drag it out. We see the word spiritless. Spiritless, which in the Greek is thumos, which denotes a strong impulse, ready for this, in the emotions, which creates a reaction rather than a response. A response. So how many right now are going, I can't believe he's talking about this. I can't believe he's talking about me. Better up. If you are, you're reacting. You're not responding. You're blaming me when you should be thanking God for bringing your issues to the forefront of your mind so that you can find a way to deal with them. I remember a pastor looking at me and said, Mr. Wheeler? And I just sat there and went, oh, no. And I know it wasn't the pastor. It was the Holy Spirit saying, I have something for you to do. And if you keep fiddle-farting around, we're never going to get to that spot. We're never going to get to that spot. So wake up. Pay attention. And respond to the words I'm giving you. Now, you know, a fool would say, nah, I'm good. Nah, I'm good. And I was foolish at some points in time. Nah, I'm good. I'm, I, got, I, I'm all, I'm, I got control of that God. I'm good. It's like one day we had a gentleman here that, you know, we're doing a Bible study, and I said, why aren't you at the Bible? Oh, I know it all. I go, you do? I go, that's too bad. I said, because I don't know anything, and I've been doing this for a little while, studying and studying and studying. I said, every day something comes that's fresh and new. Every day. Spurgeon said this. If the message hangs from the lips like icicles, it will never bring fire to the soul. If your testimony is chilly, and it's like icicles, it's never going to go. It's just going to hang there. It's just going to hang there. Interestingly enough, it's kind of interesting because Part of my testimony was my son. And my son was born with a number of issues. Down syndrome, uh, hydrocephalus, uh, um, oh my gosh, there were so many other things. And, and, and I was told he's not going to live for three days. And I've shared this. I was excited because it was a son. I had a son. We'll, we'll deal with everything else later, but I got a son. And it's kind of interesting, as time went on, he became more and more unstable. So we had to put him in a nursing home so that they could stabilize him. I always wondered why God allowed this to happen. I'm not going to go into the whole story. But I do know he passed away at five. And at five years old, we did his funeral. And the entire nursing crew from Maine Medical Center in the child wing came to his funeral. Now, my son never spoke a word. But, but by the testimony that I lived by through this whole thing, as it came out, now, and I was, I was not a, a nice person because I'm a person that wants answers. Don't just tell me because, because I'm not going to be satisfied with because. I want to know why. And, and, and again, but they saw my testimony. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. God's going to do this, so on and so forth. You know, we're going to pray. As a matter of fact, 
I'll just share this one thing. He was going to go in for heart surgery. He had a hole in his heart like that big, of course, with everything else. The doctor said he had a 5% chance of living and 95% chance of dying. And I went, let's do the surgery. And then the day of the surgery, five of us went in, laid hands on him and prayed. Laid hands on him and prayed. We said, Lord, you I, I said, Lord, you know he may not come back from this. But, Lord, I'm trusting you to do what you need to do. And then they came in and they wheeled him down. They wanted to do one more x-ray before they went in and did surgery. So all of a sudden, he's coming back. They wheeled him back in. I said, uh, what's, what's, what's wrong? The nurse said, doctor's not happy with you. I said, well, why? He said, I'll let the doctor talk to you. Now, mind you, this was a delicate surgery, and they flew in six different doctors from around the country, the top heart surgeons for children in the country. Flew them into Portland, Maine, Maine Medical Center. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. And they flew him in for this one kit for my son. And I'm sitting there going, uh-oh. And so all of a sudden, the doctor comes in. He's got, a, he's got an envelope under his arm. He takes the envelope. He flicks the x-ray light on. He jams it up there. And he goes, what did you do? I said, he says, it's gone. Where is it? It's gone. And I go, well. I said, God heard our prayers and sealed it up. And he looked at me and he goes, I don't like you very much right now. And I said, that's okay. You know, after, he goes, those other doctors are going to be mad. And I said, then you better buy them a lobster dinner. So he came back up later. And he goes, to be honest with you, he said, I've never prayed in my life. But he said, I was in my office, and I was praying that I never would have had to do this surgery. He said, how did you know? How did you know? I said, because I have a loving God, and there was only 5% chance he was going to live, my son. And I said, God decided to do what God does best. And that's give us our heart's desire. So, again, the testimony that icicles goes nowhere. That wasn't the only time God moved in my son's life. And there's, there's a ton of other stories. There's a ton of, of more testimony on that. But you may wonder why you can't lead anybody to the Lord. It's because your testimony is full of ice. Why? Because your heart's full of ice. It's full of ice because the Lord has spoken to you, and instead of responding, you've reacted in an unsatisfying manner. And you wonder why things are not falling in the way that you believe they should fall in in the Lord. Again, Spurgeon said, if the message hangs from the lips like icicles, it will never bring fire to the soul. This woman ran to town. This woman was on fire. When she was speaking, flames of joy were coming from her mouth. There was no, well, you know, it was... I can't believe this. This man has told me everything about myself. Do you think that that's the one? And again, her excitement, her fire led those to go, well, let's go find out. Let's go find out. So from the lips like Isis goes, <coughs> <clears throat> it will bring fire to the soul. How? Because we speak of the transformation of our lives through Christ. And as we speak, it's like the outward flow of a volcanic eruption. 
You picture that. You've all seen a volcano erupt. It's all over the news. Volcanoes are erupting everywhere. There's another one in Alaska getting ready to blow its top. When they go, they go. And they go with a veracity. Do we go with a veracity when we speak about the Lord? Do we, do we, are we just absolutely erupting in joy saying, wow, I can't believe this. This guy told me everything about myself. And then, and then he told me I could have living water. And oh my gosh, I left my water pot. But that's not important. The important thing is, did we just, were we just visited by? I've said this many times before, and people don't like it. If the door to this church is open, you should be here because you know what? God's got a personal message for you every single time he gathers his what? Children. Every single time. Every single time. Now, you know what? The Internet's made it easy to sit at home on your, on your rear end and, you know, not do your hair, not do your nails, not do whatever you want to do. Most, some of you sit around your underwear, your long johns, whatever. You know, again, eating refried beans and nachos. You know, when God goes, again, what does the word of God say? Don't forsake the, the gathering of the body. Don't forsake that. Why? Because when the body gathers, when two or more are gathered, when there's a lot of us gathered, the Lord visits, and we all get visited. We always get visited. So yeah, Matthew 18, 20. Let me keep going. I'm almost done. Wow, well, I get 10 more minutes. Again. This outward flow from an on-fire heart brings an inward glow to those that are looking for the truth of who Jesus is. Our outward flow produces an inward flow in that person. And that inward flow is a small flame. What's going to feed that flame? The understanding of the depth of the relationship that God has called them to have through Jesus Christ, his son. When we pray for the Lord to lead us, what are we asking? We're saying this, just like David. We're asking that there's nothing of me but everything of you. In other words, get your butt off the pedestal. You don't belong there. It's not about you. It's never been about you. People hate it when I say that. It's about God. It's about Jesus Christ, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And it's about the leading of the Holy Spirit. He chose you. He chose you. But it's all about him. It's all about him. I'm just a servant. You're just a servant. And what do servants do? Servants know what the master expects before he even opens his mouth. That's how well they know the master. See? That's how well they know the master. So we pray that the Lord would lead us. Nothing of me, God, but everything of you. Not I, but you. How did David know what stone to hurl at Goliath? He asked the Lord to lead him. He said, God, your will be done in this manner. God gave him the smooth stone. Why the smooth stone? It fit in the sling just right. David... God knew that David would be able to hold that stone. He also knew that stone would hit the perfect part of Goliath's head and bring him down. Lead me, Lord. Guide me in your way. Bring to me the things I need to be successful in your kingdom. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, remember, the meaning of the city of Samaritan, we, we remember it was a bad place, and a Samaritan speaking to a Jew, much less a Jewish woman, was not, never even thought of. So what turned that city around 190 degrees? The words fell from her transformed heart like lava. 
She spoke in kingdom language, plainly and honestly. And I love this from her experience. From her experience. Again, I've said this many, many times before. I, I'm not going to talk about you. I'm going to talk about my experience, my embarrassments, my everything. It's not that I'm trying to puff myself up or make myself look good. Is I, I can embarrass you guys all day long if I want to because I know a lot about all of you. But I choose not to because God needs to speak to you individually. Because in that individual speaking, that individual talking to, he wants to lead you out of bondage, out of the things that are keeping you held from understanding and living in the fullness of who he is. So another question this morning. We are called to defeat the dragon, correct? And in the Bible, it says the word is sharper than a two-edged sword in Hebrews 4.12. And this woman testified on what the Lord spoke to her, which I would guarantee were the words of the Father. Here's my question. When was the last time you led someone to the Lord? Oh, Pastor Mark. When was the last time you just plainly spoke to somebody about what God spoke to you and brought you out of? See? The, wor- the blood of the lamb, the sacrificial lamb that was slain, the blood, and the words of your testimony. The blood's already paid the price. What brings them to the blood? What defeats the dragon? The blood's already been paid. The the ransom's been paid. Now it's the word of your testimony. See? Because of the experiences I've had with my son, I was asked to go speak in a number of places about living with a child with all the things that were wrong. We actually... Um, it was kind of interesting because a lot of programs or a lot of things were not programs, I hate that word, but a lot of things were initiated and put into play because of my son's life that had never been put into place before. And so I was asked to go speak to a number of places. And it's kind of interesting because I would give my testimony. I would talk about the day he was born till the day he died. Twenties, early twenties. Early twenties. So, and as I spoke, I spoke what the Lord had given me. And it wasn't, you know, it was, and this happened, and this happened, there was an excitement. And this one couple came up to me afterwards and goes, and they had a son exactly, or they had a daughter actually exactly like Bobby. And they said, how'd you do it? And I said, I didn't do it. I said, the Lord did it. I said, had it been me in myself and in my flesh, I said, Lord only knows where I'd have been. I said, but you know what? I, I can do everything through him who gave me the strength to bear doing what I did. I'm just going to I'm just going to share this one last thing. When they put him in the nursing home. The closest nursing home was in Auburn. They had never dealt with this before. They didn't know what was going to happen. I'd go to work in the morning, I'd get out. There's more to the story, but I'm not going to get into that other part. I'd get out of work at 4:35 o'clock and I'd drive all the way to Lewiston. And I'd stay there until 8, 30, 9 o'clock, drive back home. Get up in the morning and do the same thing again. This was my life for a year. And then one day they said, well, we think he's stable enough. We can, we can let him go and bring him home. And I was saying, great, that's awesome, cool. You know? And so I learned how to do a feeding tube. 
I learned how to do a number of medical things. Meanwhile, at the same time, I'm taking a genetics course because I really want to find out why this had happened. So now I'm studying genetics. I'm, I'm, I'm a nurse. I'm working. And I, I just can't get into the rest of it because there's a whole other side of it. And on and on I'm going. I'm, do, I'm doing this. I have a nurse coming in to watch him during the day because, again, there was, there was other circumstances. And so then I'd come home, I'd take care of him, and, you know, it was, I learned real, I, the only time I screwed up is when I put his tube in wrong and inflated the bubble. <laughs> and he, he let me know. He was not a happy camper. But it was all because of the Lord, see. And in this whole circumstance, the lava continued to pour out because it was, we were always praising God. The doctors would say, I don't, you have such a great attitude about this. I said, well, children are a gift from the Lord. Doesn't matter what shape they're in, what color they're in, you know, what. And he used to turn purple every now and then, you know, but it didn't matter. Because God's plan is perfect. See? What pours the lava out of our heart? An explosion of joy. It was just this woman's sheer enthusiasm that changed an entire town. An entire town. When was the last time you led somebody to the Lord? Much less an entire town. I want to close with this, with John 3, 30, 35. In the tree of life. That's okay, Barbara, I didn't give it to her. Whoever receives his testimony Whoever receives his testimony has certified that the ruach of God is true. Now, ruach in the Hebrew is this. His spirit, his breath, and his wind. See, we don't speak our words. When we're given his testimony, we speak the words he has given us with the breath he has given us and the wind. Look at Acts, what happened? The Holy Spirit came in like a rushing wind. You know how many of these seats that are empty, how many of those would be full if we just spoke with the Spirit in the breath and the wind of God and had an explosion of joy for what he did for us? Don't get into lawful ridiculousness. Just, you know, the Lord loved me enough that he brought this stuff to my attention and offered me something that was amazing. Do you think he knows me personally? Do you think I had an encounter with the Messiah, with the Lord Jesus? Watch what happens. Everywhere I go, I'm speaking about he who has given me life. You should too. You should too. The blood of the lamb's already been set. But now, your part is the word of your testimony. Father, we thank you, love you, and praise you for this, this amazing series, Father. Lord, I, I know there is a deep down desire to serve you and to just run around with a volcano blowing out of our mouths. Father, and I know we really, really, really want to profess who you are. But Father, sometimes we're just like, Ugh. we need to say, Lord, fill my mouth with the joy and everlasting love that you've given us. Lord, the ransom has been paid. Now we just have to bring your life through us to set the captives free. Father, we thank you, we love you, and we praise you, Lord Jesus. In your precious name we pray, Father, amen, and amen. You are dismissed.